Well, I thought what we would do is try to take this deeper, deeper, deeper. Because what we started off with, I think, with the group yesterday afternoon was going into a lot of structural things. Mm -hmm. As if there is separate minds, and there's a right mind and a wrong mind, and, you know, getting into some basic things that um, I'm sure like Chuck and Sue who haven't been in the course for a while, those would be things that would be really helpful in even trying to grasp some of the things we're going to be going into progressively. And so I thought maybe we'll, we'll, we'll try to maybe go back to the back section um, and take a look at some of those. But on page 11 uh, from the earlier, um, I think it's in paper number 1 and it's page 11. Yeah. And this section comes right after the section um, judgment colon the wish to be the author of reality. So I think we could just summarize that by saying that that to even see a world, you know, to even perceive anything, there's an authority problem going on. And ultimately that's what we that's the basis of, of all why the mind judges and why the mind orders the illusion. You know, why the mind makes hierarchies of illusions is because it wants to be the author of itself. You know, it really believes, there's a very, 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 very deep-rooted belief that actually that reality can be selected from. And that's what all the, all the judgments in this world seem to be, literally. I choose to go here, I choose to go there, I choose to prefer this, I choose to avoid this. You know, it, there's an underlying assumption beneath all that that I can choose from reality. Reality is not something that just is that I have, that I can accept, <coughs> but it's something that I can actually select from. Mm -hmm. You know, and that parts of it I want. Parts of it that I want, and parts of it that I can actually reject. You know, and you see how that denies the wholeness mm -hmm. of of and denies the the subject object split, or it literally it makes the split seem real by the judging. That's what maintains it, so that we. When we start to move into this realm, now we can start to think of ourselves more as a mind. You know, we started to see the fallacy of all these things that we thought we were as a person. You know, I did this, I didn't do this, I'm hoping to do this in the future, and this and that, and, and just kind of take it out of the personal context, and now just shift it into a context of, I'm a mind, and I've got all these concepts and ideas, but just images, my thoughts are images I have made. And the thoughts themselves, you know, aren't the problem. But it's the ordering and the arrangement of those images that that keeps me from seeing that they're all equally illusory. So it's not that a cup in and of itself is, is good or bad, but it's just that if I believe a car is more valuable than a cup, or this body is more val val valuable than that body or than another body, or, you know, you can see where it's, yeah. it's the arranging the images is where the problem comes in. It's the decision. Yeah. Once the decision to judge presumes the belief that reality is mine to choose from, to select from. And therefore, I must still believe that reality is mine to choose from, to select from, if I continue to judge. What about valuing it all? Valuing... I mean, I thought that was the whole idea, was to recognize that there was no value in anything that's not eternal. Yes, but so it's you can't do that without without um, this or allowing the Holy Spirit to reorder the mind or giving up one's own ordering of those thoughts and images. As long as you talk about having no value in the world and you still hold on to judgment or ordering of images, then you have value. Yeah. Then you're, then you're giving it value by that. So you're not saying that what we want to do is value everything equally. Just no In the value. sense of, of everything having value, but it's the opposite. Yes. It's, it's kind of like recognizing there is no value in everything equally. Well, I think it's more likely to be the more the first. And, and what it is is that the only way that the ordering can be taken away or the only way that the ordering can be given up is to give one meaning to every image. In other words, you don't try to just, you know, say that nothing I see means anything and it's a vacuum because without saying that there has to be a purpose, which is the Holy Spirit's purpose, that unifies the perception. So that's, that's the value that you get. That's the value, that's the value that everything has. 
equally, literally, the Holy Spirit gives that equal meaning to a chair, a lamp, a body, a car, a, a trailer, you know, anything, all has one purpose. So what we're saying is that in the Holy Spirit's eyes, so to speak, that the, the idea of these things having meaning in and of themselves is meaningless. There is no such thing as a microphone defined as the deceived mind perceives it because that always has to do with speaking into and voices, well that's the body. You see how it, there's a bunch of concepts that, that have to, or with a couch. A couch is where bodies sit down in it. But, but bodies are just images too. You know, they're, they're just images just like the couch. Sitting on another image. Yeah. <laughs> and, and even the sitting on, you yeah. know, is, is yeah. part of that. It's another image. It's another image because there's a, a relationship there. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit knows that there's no relationship between the images, and the only meaning that any of the images have is the meaning that the Holy Spirit gives to the images. And in that sense, the miracle sees that they're all false. You know, that's why true forgiveness is just seeing the false as false. You know, seeing that, that that it has no positive has no cause to it. Just a bunch of images. So you see how this this kind of kicks us up into a whole different realm, a higher realm of, of, of getting away from thinking and describing things in terms of persons and behaviors. And now we're getting kicked up totally into the metaphysical realm of, of I'm a mind and I've got these thoughts and it's very disordered and I want to learn how to perceive correctly. I want to, want to allow my mind to be reordered by the Holy Spirit, which is just to say that the same meaning given to everything. So I thought what we do is we pick up this on page 11. It starts talking about ordering of thought. And it's kind of getting straight into the mind level. Only what God creates is irreversible and unchangeable. What you made can always be changed because when you do not think like God, you are not really thinking at all. Delusional ideas are not real thoughts, although you can believe in them, but you are wrong. The function of thought comes from God and is in God. As part of his thought, you cannot think apart from him. Irrational thought is disordered thought. God himself orders your thought because your thought was created by him. Guilt feelings are always a sign that you do not know this. They also show that you believe that you can think apart from God and want to. Every disordered thought is attended by guilt at its inception and maintained by guilt in its continuance. Guilt is inescapable by those who believe they order their own thoughts and must therefore obey their dictates. So you can see where the guilt coming in is that once thoughts are believed to be real, in other words, once the mind identifies even with the body and, well, I did hit so-and-so or I did yell at them, you know, I did yell at Mandy and, and I feel guilty for doing that. You know, what it's done is it's taken the body thoughts of Rhonda and Mandy and it believes that it's responsible, that, that there was a real attack that took place. And if if those thoughts, you know, body, Mandy, stream, <laughs> all those thoughts were just seen to be the, the, just illusory thoughts, not part of my right mind, not part of the, the mind that thinks with God, where would the guilt be, you know? It literally, you know, there, there could be no guilt, but, but it's the association of the mind with those thoughts that brings the guilt. Because as soon as we do that, then we all can, can look back on what seems to be a personal past history that's filled with closet full of things, you know, like with our children or with, with anyone, that we wish we had done, that we didn't do, or that we did do, you know, or it, we wish we hadn't, or you know, just constantly. But and the whole point of the course, the moment of release, is, is simply seeing that 
as a mind, that's not, those aren't real. They never have been, and they never will be. Nor are my fear thoughts about the future, about being provided for, you know, where will I be going? Will, will I be afraid if I go to other parts of the country, or will there be conditions that will arise, you know, that will, that will scare me, or whatever. All those thoughts of the future are just as equally past, yeah. past tense. Yeah, you read, read thinking your mind, because you've done it for so long, and you still do it. To believe in linear time is to simply take thoughts from the past and like project them in another direction and call that the future. Yeah. Taking the past, projecting it, and then giving it a name, future. Yeah. When really it's still past. Yeah, it's the future past. <laughs> People are going to talk about that. But you can see where the fear comes in. Yeah. If I'm identified with one of those thoughts, which is a body, you know, and I feel like, and also I believe that all the conditions of the world, economic and financial and weather and all these other things, then that's where the fear comes in. Yeah. Believing those are real thoughts. Instead of just seeing the, the unreality of it. So you can start to see how we're, we're really, when you start to see some of these things, it's really coming to a point of, of relief in the sense that you, know, you can start to get a sense of that. My mind holds only what I think was God and that's like Sue brought up, you know, she said, where does that come in? I mean, that's literally the release point. That's just another version of I am as God created me. Mm -hmm. God created me, and mind will only what I think with God. Take your version of however you like it to word it. So it's really only the mind's identification with the real thoughts, unreal thoughts, that make them seem real. Mm -hmm. right. So as soon as I can just identify from those thoughts, mm -hmm. then they're just unreal thoughts. And it believes that it can order them. You see, we're back to that ordering thing. That it, before, much less believing in them, it's, it's the ordering that makes them seem, seem real. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I have to give up the judgment, or I have to give up the ordering. Mm -hmm. In order to recognize that they're not real, right. and that they're not me. Right. Yeah. Now that's why, I mean, for, for a couple of years now, I've been, like with Beverly, you know, over the last couple of years, pointing out tiny things, I mean, even little preferences. You know, when she says, boy, I really like this, or I like this, you know, I, I'll say, oh, you'll get over it, don't worry. You know, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> and, and at the beginning, it was kind of like... <laughs> say, Donna, I'm a person here, and I, I really do like this and this and this. Because, see, at the beginning, until you get the metaphysics down, you can't see how it's... Makes any, difference. makes any difference. Like, give it's me like, a break. It's no big deal. That's right. Leave me alone. <laughs> and the pick, more, pick, pick. That's right. Pick, pick, pick. Yeah. And the more you get into it, the more it's like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a whole different turnaround from, you know, get out of my face to thank you. <laughs> There's like smells, too. Because yeah. I, I, you know, a lot of things I still, that's why I wanted to come to another, you know, to this group. Because I've let a lot of that go because I'm always by myself a lot, and I can see I can see so many things I do and say and things. But the the smell, like if ever I smell drink, it it can set up a a chain reaction of past thoughts of drink. And, but now see I can I can I know, and I say no, you don't. You're not doing that on me again. You know I I really don't want to know that. I've had enough of that. That's over with. That is gone now. Yeah, it seems that way, it but once that, again... But, you know, I it's smelled it Yes, I don't know whether you could... I smelled it yesterday. Drink, yeah. drink, in that room. Alcohol. Alcohol. I smelled yeah. it. Like somebody's breath. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know, but I smelled it real uh -huh. strong. And, then, yeah. and no. Well, and perception selective, you know, you've yeah, said that in your life, you know, being alcoholic so father... I've always been alcoholic. See, that's just a very strong association. Really, it's, yeah. an, it's an illusory association. Yeah. Yeah. And really, it, it, it may seem like the smell of drink sets off yeah. the same reaction, but once again, that would be yeah. something I informed, yeah. Yeah. triggering it. Right. But it's still in the it's mind. Still it's still the category and the ordering uh -huh. and the, the belief uh -huh. that, that's associated with alcohol yeah. and fear. And trouble. <laughs> and trouble, yeah. Or people. And that's what's uh -huh. got to be questioned. In other words, you know, the mind has that split 
and had the fear in there, and then it particularly picked out a particular thing. Like Rhonda was saying in the group the other day, there's certain.